Hello, I'm Terry Beatty. Hello, I'm Max Allen Collins. And we're on Forbidden Planet TV. To talk about Ms. Tree, Deadline. Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Andrew Sumner. I am here with the creators, of one of my all time favorite comic books, which we in the guise of Titan Comics are lucky enough to be publishing the archive editions of. It is none other than artist Terry Beatty and scripter Max Allen Collins, the creators of Ms. Tree. How are you guys? We're you fine. First, <laughs> We're fine. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I have many, many ailments, as most old people do. But other than that, I'm fine. Okay, I'm, I'm fine, you. too. And, and I also have ailments, but I'm 10 years behind Max. So I have some room to catch up. You're, you're catching up fast, though. I am. You're doing I good. Well, <laughs> I, just to put my hand in the air on this, as Max is aware, I also have ailments. So, you know, it's... You, it's you've invented ailment. some. Andrew, yeah. you've, and I've you've got them. some I've never heard of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's it it is so true. It is so true. So it, this is we are the the uh, noir crime comics ailment squad right now. Um, <laughs> so so guys, Max has been uh, Ma Ma Max and I. I'm privileged to work with Max on the on the the Mike Hammer novels that he writes for for my colleagues at Titan Books. Well, I guess I am Titan Books as well. But uh, but as as Max knows uh, and as yeah, as you'll have seen Terry I'm a, I am a, a you know Ms Tree zero point zero fan right from the get go yeah so I I actually bought you know I bought the copies of the Eclipse magazine that Ms Tree first appeared in you know I've got all I've got all the original books so being involved with this project where we at Titan have, have brought Ms Tree you know back into publication with this set of archives that we're very very proud of has been a kind of dream project for me and for for the for the viewers watching at home we're here to talk about the imminently published uh Ms. Tree archives volume four deadline and uh prior to that we've had the first three volumes which was uh one mean mother and then there was uh skeleton in the closet and then there was the cold dish and now we've got a deadline. So before we get into deadline specifically, what did the two of you remember about your mutual creation of mystery back in the day? Well, I seem to remember that uh, Max made it made the character up on the phone in a phone conversation with Dean Mullaney mm -hmm. and then called me and told me we had a gig and I needed to design the character. Uh, you know, and 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 then we just said, well, you know, since she's essentially a variation on Velda, should we just make her look like Betty Page? And we both said, nah, it's too obvious. And then, you know, three months later, Dave Stevens came out with the Rocketeer and we realized we'd made a, a tremendous error. But <laughs> not the last. <laughs> that's, that's that's fine. Uh, I, I like I like who Ms. Tree is and how she looks. And I, I think, we're, you know, it was OK in the long run. And of course, your very unique design for Ms. Michael Tree is a fundamental part of the allure of the character. She she is one of those comic book characters who is thanks thanks to your art and design, it's just instantly recognizable. Well, thank you. Well, I should say too that um, we had we had a project that we did for I think about a year and a half called the Comics Page, which was a designed to be a a page of comics, all of our own creation, that would appear in in weekly shoppers that are given away in the United States, and we sent tried to syndicate it ourselves. <laughs> Turned out not to be experts at syndication, but we had I think at our peak, maybe as many as 20, 25 No, <laughs> no. We, we, we had we needed a dozen clients, and we had six. Okay. After, All right. After sending out a hundred, hundreds, hundreds of promotional flyers, we got six clients. But we went ahead with it anyway because we thought we could build yeah. uh, the, the subscriber list over the, the years, and we lasted a year without building a subscriber list. Uh, but, but there was one important subscriber. Uh, yeah, we had one important subscriber, which was uh, 
the reader in Chicago. And they wanted specifically because, well, you know, Dick Tracy, I was doing Dick Tracy and Dick Tracy is a Chicago thing. So they, they wanted specifically the Mike Mist Minute Mystery. And that's all they wanted to run. They paid for the, the whole thing, but they ran that. And that is what Dean Mullaney saw. And he called me and said, you know, he really liked that. And would we do, you know, would we do that for him, I guess, or something else for the Eclipse magazine, which was going to be an anthology and was an anthology of basically serialized comics. And um, yeah, I made it basically made it up over the phone. Yeah. And we did, uh, Eclipse did publish a one shot uh, reprint comic book of the, the Mike Miss Minute Mysteries. So that was our first book there. I'm still waiting on uh, any kind of royalty payment on that one. <laughs> uh, we never saw a dime off of that thing, but it did lead directly to Dean asking uh, us to do Ms. Tree. So, okay, we'll, we'll forgive that one. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't know you were waiting patiently. That doesn't sound like you, Terry. The patiently part. <laughs> yes. We do a lot waiting of waiting patiently in this for forty-three years. <laughs> but he's not bitter. No, he really is not bitter. I, I'm yeah. not bitter at all about my time in the comic book industry. So, <laughs> <laughs> so can we take a step back, guys? Because you guys, of course, go way back and uh, grew up together. I believe. Can you can you just talk a bit about the genesis of your relationship, your friendship, and your creative? partnership why well, i, I it, oh, go it, ahead you know it, it it starts basically with Ter terry's father ernest Beatty, who was my favorite teacher uh in junior high and uh he he very much encouraged me and was on that short list of kind of mentors and i think terry may have known about me a little bit through his dad i don't know but Terry was working at a pizza place in Muscatine, Iowa. Isn't that right? Yeah. I mean, I was a teenager in high school and, and I, well, I knew who you were from two things. One, you'd had a letter published in uh, DC's uh, a Green Lantern, Green Arrow comics. Uh, and I pointed this out to my dad and you, you may not remember this, but he called you to, to say, oh, congratulations on getting published. <laughs> so you had a letter in my son's comic. Okay. Uh, and then the, the Nolan books came out and there was a lot of publicity locally about the first two Nolan books. And I read them and they're full of comic book stuff. And I thought, what the heck? Somebody else in town knows all this comic book stuff. I thought I was the only person here who cared. Uh, so when I was, uh, you know, just a teenager in high school and working a flunky job at the local pizza place uh and max and his wife barbara came in and i uh sort of snuck out of the back room which i wasn't supposed to do uh because they kept me chained back there uh and introduced myself and said hey i'm your old teacher's son and i want to be a cartoonist and i really enjoyed your books and that was that was the start of it yeah and and i want to say right now that terry has a better memory than i do and the bar could not be set much lower. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, but uh, and I, I don't really remember how how the friendship developed exactly. I know one of the elements was I did a, uh, I I did it like a night school kind of class on, on on movies, and Terry was in that. We went to you yeah. know discuss movies, and. Uh, then we just sort of started to hang out and yeah it was the the uh the, the film class was the main part of it and then i became the person who would go to movies with you that barb would refuse to see yeah that's so, true <laughs> so texas chainsaw massacre too sure i'll go see that everyone uh, was, needs a friend like that yeah, yes well, uh, we and, and I was the kid's sidekick, as noted, you know, he was our, teaching at the local community college and had books published. I was a teenage kid who wanted to be a cartoonist. So uh, I was the kid. And, you know, and, and that that dynamic has still persisted somewhat annoyingly in, 
our relationship. And now the kid is 64 with gray <laughs> hair and age spots that's making him look like a Drew Friedman drawing. But, uh, you know, it, it is pretty what much it is. what he looked like in, back when I met him. So I don't know I, what he's talking no. about. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of years packed on here. Well, we made a lot of discoveries together. We, uh, where movies were concerned, Phantom of the Paradise is, remains Wonderful a huge film. Yeah. And I mean, that's, I think in both of our top five films, yeah. probably. And, uh, and then I introduced them to a lot of stuff, things like Prisoner Soul Block H. And there was a lot of feeding back and forth of pop culture stuff. And, and that wonderful moment when you realize you're not the only person who likes something. Yeah. Specific, I mean, comics in general, but specifically, you could, you could say, you know, Johnny Craig and the other guy goes, Oh, Johnny Craig. You know, and so, <laughs> and Will, Will Eisner, who yeah. honestly, Will Eisner was not a household name when, when Terry and I met. And so those kinds of resonances uh, are really a um, powerful thing to build a friendship on. And then he was a good, good young cartoonist. So I thought, Hmm, cheap labor you know <laughs> well i was a fair young cartoonist I, hopefully i turned into a good one Take yes a very good now i i turned into a very good one uh, more, and more on that in a little bit because i just want to talk a little bit about your post mystery career which is very very interesting very very interesting anybody with an interest in comics but uh to flip back to mystery for a second so this is the the fourth archival collection of, yes. of, of mystery and the, the plan for it has been an unusual one because we kind of started with volume one sort of two-thirds of the way through we started with i think what you guys considered to be your your creative apex and then we kind of took a step back and did the origin stuff um, yeah that was my idea and i don't know i i, I think terry went along with it I, he might not have agreed with it but we both i i thought we should lead with our strong what i considered to be our strongest material thought it was very accessible and, and terry had really developed into to i think a terrific artist he always been good but but he because he started out in un, doing underground type comics and funny stuff took it and being rooted in syndicated comics i think it took him a while to find essentially his voice and uh, by by the DC material, uh, he really had. Plus, it was DC material, so yeah. so I knew that the DC collectors would come on board for those books, and then maybe they'd stick around to see the rest of it. Uh, but I mean, we we get complaints all the time. Why did you start with uh, you know <laughs> issue this and that? Say, like, well, you know, we we had kind of started over in a way at DC because we knew we'd have a bigger audience. So we caught everybody up. It was not an awkward place to begin. What we didn't know was we were kind of alternating. This was not planned. We were alternating a, you know, individual stories, self-contained stories, little mini graphic novels, because they, they ran in 40 to 50 some pages, and with a continued story, an arc. And we ended up for the cold dish, putting the arc together as one big graphic novel and really the biggest Ms. Tree graphic novel. And then the others are basically an anthology of what we did. And I, I should mention, because this is a key thing, Ms. Tree grew, grew out of frustrations I had on doing the Dick Tracy comic strip because I, would, I was trying to do, first of all, I didn't get along very well with the artist. And and I got along well with with Terry, at least comparatively. I did. <laughs> and well, we had our and, moments. We had our moments, but you know the you know the the idea was that these these stories about contemporary topics. You know, Chester Gould was doing contemporary topics all the time, particularly in the the early in through the thirties and in the, into the forties. And I'd come with a topic, and they wouldn't let me do it. So Ms. Tree became this place where, I think that was the light bulb that went off talking to Dean Mullaney on the phone. I can do the stories here that they won't let me do in Dick Tracy. So we were very contemporary. And the biggest irony of it to me is, 
and kind of in a way a disappointment is that most of the topics, maybe all of the topics that were problems of the day are still problems today. Yeah. Decades yeah. later. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 absolutely. That's one of the sobering things I think about catching up with these stories again. It's like, man, it's like a boomerang. I thought we were past all this and we're not. Not at all. Um, so can you can you talk to the uh, the specific stories that are contained within de within deadline? At what point have we got within the kind of mis mis mystery mythos by the time we get to deadline? Terry? Oh well, I'd have to remember what all stories are in there. Um, <laughs> I think I think we're starting. I think we're start we're starting with the uh, essentially the the renegade press material. Right. Um, That's it. Uh, which you know we we finished with Eclipse and ended on uh, one of the the Ms. Tree Mike Mist crossovers, uh, which was fun, but not maybe not an essential story, not really part of Ms. Tree's ongoing story. Uh, and so the uh, so the stories in Deadline. I mean, there's there's the uh, the slasher killer story. Uh, there's uh, was the, uh, the the beauty queen story. Uh, th there's a lot of stuff that just, again, sort of stories that are coming out of the headlines of, you know, the newspapers of the day. Uh, and we also, you know, started with this two color thing that I thought was a great idea uh, because we discovered that doing full color was just prohibitively expensive. Yeah. But that two color was like, you know. 50 bucks more than black and white. And yeah. so I thought, well, that just means I need to take some time and do some color overlays and we can uh, do a kind of a different look than any other American comic has. Uh, and my inspiration, oddly enough, for that came from uh, the reprints of Tintin in uh, a children's magazine. And it was Children's Digest or Humpty Dumpty, one of those little children's digest magazines uh, that I read as a kid where that's how they presented Tintin to American audiences. It wasn't full color. It was this uh, simple two color presentation. And uh, the first uh, books landed in our laps and the printing was awful. Now, the color was really oversaturated and looked terrible. And I was very upset about it. And Max was mad at me about <laughs> was and, and I explained it's the printer. It wasn't me. It was the printer. Uh, and so the reprints of these uh, have been this wonderful opportunity for me to once the the original comics have been scanned to go in and fuss with that color and knock it down a little and fix it. Uh, and and so one of the things I really like about these books is they look better than the original comics ever did because uh, wow. I've been given the opportunity to make some of those corrections and I'm not, and I'm not redrawing anything. Uh, although I am tempted to, <laughs> but I have fixed a few things in Photoshop. It's like, Oh, that eye is just a little too low. Huh. No, <laughs> we'll fix that. Just move that up a little, no redrawing actually, but a little fixing. Uh, so that the the art looks better uh, than it ever did. I, um, I couldn't agree more. And I think this is a very, I'm so glad you're on here to talk about this, Terry, because it's such an important point for any mystery fans watching. These archive editions collectively, it, it's presenting your art in, in, with, it, with, in, with its best face. It, the, the series really does look better than it ever has. And uh, you know, one scan through deadline will absolutely reward anybody who's a mystery fan. I think that they really are. If you if you've ever been in if you've been intrigued by reading mystery or you loved it back in the day, you've really got to pick these books up because that they're, they're, they're presenting the whole series, you know, it, in it with its kind of best shop window, as it were. Yeah, and I also have to say, looking at the artwork, and it's it, it's always difficult for me to look back at older work. Because uh, I have that self-critical artist thing that never lets me be happy with my work five minutes after I'm done with it, because I can only. I love I love everything that I've ever done. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. But you actually have to sit down and read it to figure out what you don't like. I just a quick glance is is all I have to do. No, I'm telling the truth. I like everything I've written. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I do too. But anyhow. <laughs> 
uh, I, I looking at, at this volume, there's still some of the early stuff where I just, I think, well, I'm still figuring it out, but not too long into this volume, there start to be a lot of pages where I'm thinking, well, uh, that kid was pretty good. <laughs> These comics look good. What's man. All right. I figured some things out by the time I drew this. Uh, so I'm, I'm really pleased to see, see all this back in print. Fantastic. And I, I'm I'm very pleased that you're pleased, and I, and, I, and I know that Max is pleased. Now, and we are pleased, of course. And your your career post, uh, well, concurrently to mystery and post mystery has been fascinating because, of course, the two of you when you were at DC, you co-created one of my favorite DC, DC characters, Wild Dog. Yeah, and then and then Terry, you were heavily involved with the uh, the, the beautiful comic book versions of the the animated universe for a long time. Mm -hmm. And 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 then uh, to plow further into my personal interest, then you did, then you you illustrated the Phantom Sundays for about I think it was about five years or so. There's a whole conversation in that, by the way, which I'm not going to have with you right now because <laughs> I could ask you about that for an hour, and I think I'm going to try and create the chance to do so. Okay. Uh, and, and and so more more on that later. And then of course, fascinatingly, you transition into being into being the artist. And, and latterly, the artist and writer on the on the, the classic uh, American newspaper strip, uh, Rex Morgan, MD. So, looking back on all that, Terry, what have been the highlights for you? Um, well, um, you know, I really enjoyed uh, doing Wild Dog. That was a lot of fun. Uh, great the notion of that was that it was a superhero series that you know didn't rely on superpowers. He was sort of this blue collar homemade superhero and it was set in our backyard. It was set in the Midwest in the very real Quad Cities area because all the superheroes were either, you know, New York or some fictional version of New York, maybe Chicago occasionally, rarely Los Angeles, but that was it. It was just all the big cities. And that, well, where's the Midwest? Let's let's get some Midwest representation going here. Uh, and it was huge in our local area. Max and I did signings at comic book stores where there were lines around the block. I mean, you'd have thought we were the Beatles or something. It was yeah. crazy. But it was huge in the Quad Cities. It wasn't huge elsewhere. And so, you know, didn't didn't go on forever. Uh, but it keeps popping back up, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in bad. Uh, but the, the fans won't let I me forget you. about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know if we want to talk about the bad parts, uh, <laughs> but it, it's, you know, it, for being a, a four issue miniseries, a one shot and a couple uh, serialized stories in uh, the, the not very well thought out action comics weekly, uh, the character still seems to have legs, which is just funny. Uh, but I love I, I had this say... weird part of my career where I transitioned into being an anchor. Uh, yeah. And okay. that got me the uh the batman adventures gig which i did on and off with different cartoon based titles uh for 11 years and working with some terrific people uh managed to get an eisner award out of it because paul dini joe staten and i did the uh graphic novel adaptation of the world's finest uh animated cartoon we won best graphic novel that year which uh, i still shake my head about that's a little hard to believe but i've got the plaque love, on the wall i love that uh, by the way i think this entire run that you had because i think the great thing about the batman adventures is the quality is so high and in mm -hmm. a way i think at that time often where you'd find the best batman comics would be in the, the the best purest batman comics would be actually in the batman adventures without all the baggage that surrounded the the core book absolutely Absolutely. And uh, it, it's weird because overall, those were the least selling Batman titles at the time, but there were stores where they knew how to sell to a, uh, a, a broader audience than just comic book fans, where it was their top selling Batman book. And DC was always mystified by those stores. They could never figure it out. How come that's your best selling Batman book? We don't get it. Because that was the cartoon book. It was this thing they did on the side that they didn't really care that much about. Uh, but that was the Batman that a whole generation grew up with. There were far more people who watched that cartoon series than ever read the comic books. Wow. And now we're starting to see the results of that because of the low print runs on those books. Uh, the key issues, at least, are starting to go for 
insane money. Um, uh, Batman Beyond, number one, with the miniseries especially, um, like, you know, super minty copies of that are selling for thousands of dollars. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> couple of, couple of, uh, couple you guys, of come on, you should have been reading it. A couple of interesting things. Uh, Terry and I had basically pitched, was it to G- Giordano? Mm-hmm. Forget what we did. We pitched exactly the concept of what the animated TV show was for comics. We said we wanted to do Batman for a younger audience. And we had, sa- I think we had samples and they just hardly even listened to us. I mean, you could see the eyes glaze over as yeah. we pitched this this thing. Well, yeah, what we pitched specifically was was a magazine that would have had a Batman story, a Superman story, and then a revolving slate of the other classic DC characters done in a family-friendly kind of way that they could sell in grocery stores and bookstores and attract a bigger audience. And they just said, well, we're not in the magazine business. The TV series came along and Welch Publishing started doing a Superman Batman Adventures magazine that outsold every single DC comic book. <laughs> that was essentially the magazine we pitched. And then Marvel Comics bought Welch and that ended the DC license. And then DC never could figure out how to do that again because they weren't in the magazine business, even though they were owned by the same company that published mad magazine and time magazine and i, I don't ask me to explain it i can't but <laughs> also also there's a there there's a, a corollary to what terry was saying about how well those comics he worked on sold in specific kinds of stores i had this very i'm going to use the word controversial rather than say much hated run of about a year on batman as you where, know i love that run as we've talked well, about many times. What was interesting is, and I think you know this story, Terry. Yes. Uh, Toys R Us at that time was in business and very doing very well. And they they went to DC and said, we want to do some pa- you know, these packages of like three or four comics in a in a, in a plastic bag. And we want to do Batman, because the Batman movies were big. And so they they went back and looked at the last, I don't know, five years of Batman. And all they chose were my issues. And and I made probably the only really good comic book money I ever made on the Toys R Us issues uh, of Batman. And so Terry and I have both done, he's done a lot more Batman than me. We we could never get them to let us do it together. No. And and that was such a natural thing yeah. that, that we would do Batman together. And I think that was a not on our part was a missed opportunity on their part uh if, yeah if we pitched a uh, we pitched a saturday afternoon serial 1930s style batman that would have been fun wonderful. uh max pitched a uh a batman dick tracy crossover uh when the dick tracy movie was happening that would have been done as uh like faux sunday newspaper comics and they just no nah, we just don't see the point <laughs> no no it's well, it's been it's been frustrating and uh you know it's you know the other thing it's to, to jump subjects a bit um it's been interesting to see ms tree really very warmly regarded and talked about positively because we were swimming against the tide in a major major way and we had major elements of comics fandom publications basically attacking us and it, you know that we there, nobody else was doing crime comics but us so if you talk to some of the people that went on to be successful in crime comics you will find out that that we were you know we were the roots of it yeah at least partly um i think that's absolutely true i, mean, <laughs> I think the great crime comics of today owe a huge debt to what the two of you did with mystery there is no doubt about it I well, agree. Where's my, where's my, where's my paycheck then? <laughs> well, but I mean, I mean people set up a GoFundMe and, and those guys can pay me for the debt they owe me. Things. <laughs> well, the, the thing that, that has occurred to me looking at this material, Terry and I periodically, and we, we this goes back to when Road to Perdition came out uh, as a film, and I was hot for like 15 minutes. And 
we could have probably gotten a Ms. Tree project going then. Titan talked to us about it, as a matter yeah. of fact. And now I look at this material and I'm like very aware that it's, if we were to do something again, we just about have to do it in period. I, it's the year slipped by and suddenly <clears throat> the work you've done was in period. Yeah, and she's yeah. such an 80s kind of creation now that would be, you know, not could, could they put her on TV with cell phones and compete? Yeah. yeah, sure. You can do that. But our mystery is very much grounded in, in I think, the 80s. I haven't even talked to Terry about this. Yeah, she'd be a grandma now <laughs> if we yeah. stuck with real time. Yeah, that, that is that is very interesting. And um, I'm. Before we close out, guys, Terry, I've got I've got one question because we've got we we've got for the for the English element of our audience, for the British element of our audience, the European element. Can you just get people up to speed on on who and what Rex Morgan MD actually is? <laughs> I can do that. One thing I want to say real quick, though, is I do want to give some credit to uh, uh, my pal Gary Cotto uh, for his contributions to our mystery work. Because uh, Gary worked with us for years and sometimes uh, did pencils from my layouts, sometimes inked stuff, lettered almost all of it. And uh, sometimes he's the forgotten man in uh, in the process. And I just want to make sure we, we get him mentioned. Oh, I think that's extre extremely laudable and very well said. Yeah, yeah. very well said. Um, well, Rex Morgan, MD, uh, is a newspaper strip. Uh, began in, I believe, 1949, 40, 48, 49. Uh, written by a guy named Nick Dallas, who also uh, created Judge Parker and uh, Apartment 3G. Uh, and uh, it was a very popular soap opera strip, uh, a, a quite good strip, I think, from the 50s uh, into the 60s. Uh, by the 70s, it had become a little stodgy and dull, and uh, <clears throat> I don't think was in nearly as many papers as it had been. <laughs> Uh, but but had some pretty good artists work on it over the years. The original team of uh, uh, Bradley and Edgington were unusual in that Bradley drew the characters, Edgington drew the backgrounds, and it was the only instance I know of where the background guy gets a full credit uh, on the strip. Uh, and then an, a number of other artists took over. Frank Springer drew it for a time. Uh, uh, Fernando da Silva drew it for a bit, who was the the, the artist that Max worked uh, uh, with on the, the Heaven and Heller uh, comic strips uh, at one point that became the Nate Heller books. Uh, Tony DePreta, uh, who had been a longtime Joe Palooka artist, drew it. And then Graham Nolan, who's a fellow Phantom artist, drew it for like 15 years or something. And Graham was retiring from it because he said he'd just drawn one too many scenes of people talking on cell phones to each other. Because it's a soap opera. That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'd already been doing Phantom Sunday for some time for King. And uh, they brought me in on, on Rex. And ultimately, I gave up the Phantom when I ended up also writing Rex because doing a daily and Sunday comic strip by yourself is a, is a bit of a job. Yeah. <laughs> and I was working seven days a week. And at my age, I'm not, no, too old for that. Uh, but essentially, it's the story of a, a doctor, his, his, uh, uh, his wife, and uh, their family and their friends. And it's all just kind of small stories, little stories, the stories got smaller during COVID. <laughs> because I couldn't have them go out and do anything. So uh, did some flashbacks, did some imaginary stories. Rex has a very uh, imaginative daughter who imagined him as uh, comic strip and comic book heroes for a few weeks, uh, which was fun. Yeah. Uh, some of the readers had a hissy fit, but the, <laughs> some of the readers have a hissy fit over anything. <laughs> I had, this is the thing I discovered is you can't pay attention to the criticism from some of the readers because most people read the strip they enjoy it, then they go about their lives. Some people will read it, uh, freak out over the weirdest stuff, and send you an angry note. My favorite was the woman who was very upset with me because I bold-faced some of the words in the lettering. And I, I stupidly wrote back and said, well, I'm sorry that this troubles you, but that's a long-standing tradition in comic strips to bold-face some of the words, uh, just you know, for emphasis and, and also... Uh, to break up the the graphic 
uh, look of the, the big batch of lettering. Uh, you know, sorry that this bothers you so much. And she said, well, I don't care that you boldface words. It's that you're boldfacing the wrong words. <laughs> and I didn't reply. That's, that, that's okay. I give up. I mean, it's I'm really, just going to do this joke. It's really quite an amazing journey being on from, from your beginnings from mystery, you know, through to through Batman, Wild Dog, the Phantom to Rex Morgan, you know, and well, I'm very happy to be doing newspaper strip. Um, uh, I uh, uh, remain uh, sad about the fact that uh, Max and I never got to do one together because we tried. Well, we did we did that year's worth of that self syndicated thing, but I'm not sure that counts in the long run. Uh, I think the plan uh, that we both had in our heads at some point was that I would eventually work with him on Dick Tracy, and that didn't happen because uh, I think that would have been a, a perfect fit would for both of us. For both of you guys, yeah, for sure. Uh, never happened, uh, but I sure enjoy I sure enjoy doing Rex. Uh, it, it's it, it's in enough papers that they keep it going, and it's in few enough papers that they just leave me alone and let me do whatever I want. So I, I have done some kind of crazy goofball stuff in it and some things uh, for pop culture fans and even comics fans. I have a character who is a uh, 90 something year old retired horror cartoonist who is making money hand over fist doing commissions for fans. Uh, who's, and he's essentially Graham Ingalls if Ingalls had lived and been a little more sociable. Uh, <laughs> maybe a little Angelo Torres thrown in. Uh, but you wouldn't have seen that in the previous incarnation of Rex Morgan. That that mate, that is just absolutely wonderful. And, and while it's a great shame that you and you and Max never got to do your newspaper strip, you do have this glorious run on Ms. Tree now up to four volumes, including this volume four deadline mm -hmm. to look back on. And I'm so pleased that you're both happy with the package, the the archive package that we've got going. There is, of course, there's one volume left to go now. So Volume four deadline is about to publish, and then volume five will be out next year. Do we have a title for that one yet, guys? No idea. No idea. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I think I, I think I put one on it when we did the uh, original pitch. Uh, I mean, it, to to talk about Titan for just a second, Nick Landau has been just a champion of mystery from the beginning. Yeah, we we just have been talking to him about this. And we were reluctant to do it because we wanted to do a, a grab a new graphic novel. And I mean, I actually had one figured out. And then we were both too busy to to be able to do it. And now Terry's doing a syndicated comic strip. I don't have any interest in doing a mystery graphic novel with anybody but Terry Beatty. I mean, that that would be a sin. <laughs> so yeah, and I, uh, I have no time and he, he has no he has no time and really neither, neither do I so I, I think it's okay to look at this body of work and say well, that's what it is yeah. that's that's what yeah. it is it's a shelf now now there if people really really want more we've we've got stuff we did we didn't include everything in the archives we did a thing with Joe Staten called the PIs which was uh, Mike Mauser meets Ms. Tree. That isn't in any of these books, I don't believe. And, uh, you know, so we could we could probably throw something together. Maybe we could even do do like a two-page story or something. <laughs> <It's brand new. laughs> now, give me a year. I can get that done somehow. I can squeeze that in. I, I'm going to hold both of you to that. And I think that, uh, that is the perfect place at which to close out. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your memories of, of both of you for sharing your memories of mystery. And we've been talking about mystery archive series, volume four deadline, which is available for order from the links attached to our conversation. Uh, Terry, Max, as always, it's been an absolute pleasure. You take care of yourself, gents. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Good to see you, Terry. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.